Yeah, I don't have a good. I don't have a big re reproduction right. of it. I don't have a big reproduction. All right. So this, but this would be helpful. Yeah. If we want to talk, if he wants to compare the design here and show how it was influenced by the Vermeer over here, that's going to be a problem later on. Okay. Okay. So we'll yeah, just start. All right. So I then maybe what we should do is start with the gamble. Yeah. The backgrounds. Yeah. I mean, he's welcome to. In other words, what we could do also is we can do it twice. Yeah. Okay. You, if you want to talk about. Yeah. Doing it there, and then we can get you just talking about it and gesturing over towards sure, the mirror sure. as a separate item. Yeah, sure. So if we did it twice, because actually the shot here of him leaning back in is not as nice to the it's picture. It's beautiful. Yeah. 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 So, it's, it's, so you're really talking about this picture and comparing it. Okay. And okay. Take sure. Second Great. Okay. Great. Okay. And any time. We're trying again. Okay. We're trying again. You know, because we're curious. There's a parallax effect. Right. <laughs> <laughs> One's low and the other one. You know. <laughs> Cameras are here, we're not here. Right. It's just a conversation. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm interested in hearing about how you met Mr. Gamble and what some of the stories that you were telling us yesterday All at right. lunch. I, <clears throat> when I got out of the service, the day after I got out of the service, I started in the Nat School, at West Bajard School of Art. And I was struck that there were only two teachers that to me kept Every, t every time they, they'd make an observation on your painting or something, it all sort of fit into an overall scheme. And you could sense that as you got to know what they're talking about, it's that, that their overall approach fitted into a bigger view of what picture making is. And then I found out that they both studied with the same man, this elderly painter named R. H. Ives Gamble, who was a very old, sort of eccentric, Payne, who did these very personal and very esoteric, intellectually based history paintings. And that he took on private students, but that he was impossible, almost impossible to meet. And, and uh, I, you know, I never thought I'd had a chance of ever studying with him. And after about a year and a half of, of, of art school, where I, I really didn't like it at all, that was a, kind of a waste of time. I was going to go to New York to the Art Students League. And Mr. Hunter, Bob Hunter, who studied with Mr. Gamble, asked me if I wanted to study with him. He was going to take on three private students in the Fenway Studios, where we are now. And He was one of the two teachers. He yeah, he was one of the two teachers. He, he and Robert Carmier were the two teachers at, at Resper George that just made sense. I mean, they, they made observations. Um, so many art teachers will say, put more guts into it. Or, uh, Gee, that really works, and just leave you in the dark. And I, um, which is, I, had, I really felt like I, w I wasn't learning anything in art school, except um, cliches, <laughs> meaningless cliches. <laughs> And um, so this opportunity to study with Hunter in the Fenway Studios was free, working from nature, from cast drawings. And, and so I started to do that with three students. And Mr. Hunter brought us up to meet Mr. Gamble. And the first thing Mr. Gamble said to me and, and to the other two fellows, he, well, you're 24 years old, you're too old, you'll never learn anything. <laughs> and, and dismissed us. Yeah. But over the course of the next year and a half, I would bring up studies of imaginative paintings and things that I'd fooled around with. And, and I do pictures with puppets in them. And how that got started is that I really didn't, I wasn't particularly interested in painting pots and pans, still lifes. And still lifes is essential to the Boston school. It's, it's really a still life school of painting. So I wanted to do something that would be storytelling and, 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 and I like theatrical things. So I started to just fool around with these little mannequins. You buy these little 18-inch high mannequins you buy in the art store, and I sort of put capes on them and things, and, and did sort of Wagnerian opera scenes. <laughs> and Mr. Gamble thought they were kind of entertaining and interesting. And um, so that from there, I started, I got more interested in it. And I, I like the idea of puppets. They're very theatrical. You can do anything with a puppet. You can exaggerate anything, it's appropriate. So I started to learn how to carve my own puppets and I actually learned how to carve puppets the way I was taught painting. I got a 
Very good example. Mr. Gamble owned a wonderful set of Carmine Del Arte puppets that he used in The Hound of Heaven in some of his pictures. He had a set of like 24 puppets of Carmine De Del Arte puppets, characters. So I, bought, bought, I borrowed one and I did a copy of it. <laughs> as, as we did copies. Yeah, yeah, as we did copies of, um, of paintings. And actually, in actually, I believe it's in Don Quixote, a book published in 1615, the second part, that um, he, he says that if you want to learn how to do something, get a very good example of it and do an exact copy. And that's how you learn. And so, in the seventh, so that's a very much a 17th century um, approach. And later on in life, I, as I went along, I started to get more and more interested in the 17th century. Uh, but Mr. Gamel, getting back to Mr. Gamel, as I get to know Mr. Gamel, he's, he, uh, I consider him a great artist. Some, some of his work is, is truly amazing in, in terms of workmanship, imagination, uh, the, the symbolism that he would draw, they would gather from all different cultures. The research he did, he worked incredibly hard he, um, he had a passion, a passion for, for art. And I, I really admired all those facets of his personality. And art history, he loved art history. And I, was, I considered it extremely fortunate that I studied with him. But he, but he was a very demanding man and he was also difficult. Um, he... <laughs> Well, he, he, he was famous for, for, his, for his rages and his harsh criticism. I remember him saying things like, you should be a plumber. <laughs> Working on a painting is not, <laughs> not terribly encouraging. <laughs> but you started studying with him uh, after? In 73. Yeah, from 73 to 79. Here at Fenway. Yeah, here in the Fenway studio. Uh, I don't know if anybody mentioned it, but another aspect that Mr. Gamble brought to teaching is that he would give us tickets to opera, the plays, the ballet. He thought you had to, you had to learn about the culture. You know, if you're going to be involved in the arts, you had to learn something about the culture. And he encouraged us to reading. Um, he, he was passionate about Wagner. We had to see Wagner's Ring and all these uh, light opera. <laughs> Which actually was all good. I, I really love theater. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not music. I don't care about opera very much, but yeah. I love theater. Yeah. And up in Williamstown, there was the Williamstown Theater Festival, and we'd go to 12 plays in the summer. Every summer, that was the best part of Williamstown. Can you talk a little bit about how he took care of his students? What he would do, I mean, he really, uh, what you were talking about yesterday. Like financially, yeah. you mean? Yeah, That's well, he, he paid for all of our supplies, he paid for the models. He, I became sort of an assistant for him, mm -hmm. and he gave me $1,000 a month and a car to use, mm -hmm. and paid for everything. And actually, uh, I think a story in, indicative of Mr. Gamble and perhaps of Yankees, a New England Yankee, is um, one year, just before we were going to Williamstown in the spring, Mr. Gamble called me in and he said, well, David, I, I don't think we're going to be able, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't think we're going to be able to go to Williamstown. I just got this huge bill from, from the art store. I just got this huge bill for $124. And I don't know what I'm going to do. I just don't know. I, I'm really concerned. About a week later, he calls me in again, and he tells me, well, I want you to know my brother would die the year before. The state was a set settled, and I got a little money from my brother. So we're going to get through the summer. So we'll, we'll, we will be going to Williamstown. I later found out that the little money he received from his brother was something like $5 million. <laughs> And he had this huge bill for $125. <laughs> 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 
Another thing I liked about Mr. Gamewan, which was quite contrary to my way, I came from a middle class family, although a lot of my family self employed, they own businesses, but yeah. middle class families. And if you had a good year, you'd brag about, you know, geez, we, you know, we had the best year we've ever had. All, Mr. Gamewan, all of his friends would constantly tell you how poor they were. <laughs> And, uh, and Mr. Gamble, whenever you were going to, he was going to take you to visit one of his friends, and he would say, now, 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 these people, these people are wealthy. They're not like me. <laughs> these people really, have, really have money. You wait till you see their home. And, and if you get to know any of these people, they would sooner or later say to you, now, now, we're not wealthy like Mr. Gamble. <laughs> it was a, such a totally different world than what I was brought up in, <laughs> where everybody was denying money, I thought. <laughs> so after a while it became a little difficult to, to stay with him. You said, who was it who said the best day, the best um, two days of their lives? Richard Whitney. Richard Whitney said that you know, the best two days of his life was the day he met Mr. Gamble and the day he left Mr. Gamble. And unfortunately, that's true. Mr. Gamble was very demanding and and as, it, as you went on and as you became more proficient at painting, I personally think he became more insecure about what you, about your relationship with the studio and what you were going to do. And he never felt like anybody was ever ready to go on their own. And um, it, he would sooner or later make it just impossible to stay, which probably is one of the reasons why he had so many students. <laughs> Well, they, they, it became impossible to stay, so there was a turnover of students. Some students could only take, you know, one year of criticism. Some, some could take only one month. <laughs> His criticism could be very harsh. But he's very knowledgeable. Very knowledgeable. And as I said, passionate. And he, and he knew such wonderful stories. Um, he was in Paris when the First World War broke out. He had to leave Paris because of the First World War. And then later on, he was stationed in Paris. In 1917, 1918, he was stationed in Paris. And he, uh, he, 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 he told me he would see Degas walking around the left banks of Paris. And, and I believe he went also to the studio sale, Degas' studio, after he died. Because he owned a pastel box that was stamped with the, with the uh, Degas' studio stamp. Um, Could you talk about other artists that he had studied with you? And met in when he was in Paris, he, 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 he had a studio that he, he only had to work half a day in the army. He was in army intelligence. He only had to work half a day. And he had the whole afternoon to paint. Mm -hmm. And he was in the studio. One of the studios he was in, Sargent had. He had a, he had a studio that Sargent once had. Well, I, probably when he was a student in Paris. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he met the camp when he was there. The camp came over along with Tarbell to paint portraits of the generals at the Versailles Treaty. And he went around as the museums were reopening with the camp. And he went to the Louvre with the camp, to the Just Palms, to a lot, well, I'm not sure if the Just Palms was open then, but uh, to a number of different museums with the camp. And he said that was a, a, a great experience because the camp was so insightful in the painting. And of course, you know, Mr. Gamble, when he first went into painting, the first time he came to the Fenway Studio was something like 1909. Did you, you know the story? First time he came, he had a letter of introduction to Joseph de Camp. And um, he was seeking advice about becoming a professional artist. And de Camp's, <laughs> de Camp's advice was... It's, it's really wonderful in a way. Uh, no one would, uh, not many people would dare give it today. He said, he said to Mr. Gamble, paint with a Christian who paints the truth. <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> kind of a time, yeah. time sensitive <laughs> observation. <laughs> And, and actually, another story about Mr. Gamble early on, I don't know if, you, if anybody's talked about how he met Sargent. He also had a letter of introduction to Mrs. Gardner. 
And he went over to Mrs. Gardner's studio, uh, home, which was, yeah, Fenway Court. And uh, Mrs. Gardner uh, invited him to go to opera with her, to, be, to sit in, his, in her box with him. And Sergeant came along. And Mr. Gamble said that, uh, unfortunately, it turned out to be not the evening one would have hoped for. He said, during the first pause in, in, between the acts, Sergeant went out in, in, the, in the hallway and was smoking a cigar. And, and Mr. Gamble went up to him and started to tell him how much he, he, he admired his work. And Sergeant got this very bored look on his face and walked away. <laughs> And, and that was, uh, that, that, that's his kind of, his, you know, he said he'd seen, he would see Sergeant around town. Sergeant used to have breakfast at the uh, Park Plaza, I think it was. He used to stay there when he was working on the murals. So he'd see Sergeant around town, but he, and he, didn't, he didn't have any more social contacts with him. And, not, and that same evening, he also had a, an unpleasant encounter with Mrs. Gardner. Uh, Mrs. Gardner owned, in fact, <coughs> it's still in the museum, at the, Fenway, at the Fenway Court Museum, the Gardner Museum, there's a head of Pope Innocent X that's called School of Alaskas. When she bought it, and she paid a lot of money for it, she bought it as a Velasquez. And I think it was Levine who told her to buy it, but anyways, she bought it as a Velasquez and paid a lot of money for it. And she, someone had mentioned to her that Joseph de Camp, who was a prominent portrait painter in Boston, was very knowledgeable about Velasquez. And so she invited him to come over and take a look at his Velasquez. So de Camp goes over and looks at it and goes, well, Mrs. Gardner, that's a very fine painting, but Velasquez never did it. <laughs> she practically threw him out and never spoke to him again, I guess. And, and now, it's, now it's called the school of, yeah, yeah. And when I was an art student, I didn't appreciate the difference. But now when you look at it, you can see that it doesn't have the masterful control of light effect and form that a Velasquez has. It's a good copy, but it's, it's a copy. Um, and, but Mr. Gamble that evening, Mrs. Gardner said, said to uh, Mr. Gamble, what, what, what exactly are you doing in, in, in Boston? Said, well, I'm going to be studying painting with Joseph de Camp. <laughs> 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 that was the end of that. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you feel you, you learned from Gamble? that have influenced your own work, or maybe that you have, over the years, um, moved beyond, or... Um, Gamble was... Gamble always talked about art history, and he would give us little quizzes and look up things in art history. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I happen to enjoy history as, as just sort of a yeah. sidelight. I just, I'm passionate about history. And Mr. Gamble always encouraged that. And I think that was a great asset because one, one facet of Mr. Gamble's teaching was that he would tell you things about design, color relationships, edges, how to put down paint, how, how to make joints where two different colors meet. And you could go to the paintings in the museum and you could see what he was talking about in the old master's work. And you felt like you were learning this language that had evolved in the Renaissance. That you might say, you know, depending how you look at it, did it begin with Giotto or did it begin, begin with like the Mona Lisa? You know, the Mona Lisa is one of the greatest, one could argue that the Mona Lisa is one of the greatest impressionist paintings ever done. <laughs> um, and, and maybe the first, <laughs> in some ways, yeah. in some ways. Yeah. It, if you don't think of it in terms of French impression and color shift, but just right. in terms of value relationships, sure. it's a beautiful, subtle observation of form, of, of light coming through a, a, a gauze. You know, he painted it outside in the court, and he had light coming through a gauzy material. 
and, and actually, you know, when you go to Italy and you go to, and you see the farms of Italy, you know, they hang gauzes up to shade the trees from that insistent Italian sun. And I wonder, I wonder if Leonardo didn't see figures under the gauze and saw that magical, soft, overhead light. And I wonder if that's what didn't inspire the Mona Lisa. Because I've noticed that. You, you see that all over Italy. You see these, 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 this gauzy material shading trees, lemon trees and things. And I, I often wonder if that's where Leonardo got the idea for it. Also, of course, it also it, it would give you more constant light by doing that, too. And the sun coursing so much. And, well, so Mr. Gamble encouraged this art history, and you could, as I said, you could see it. When you went to the museum, you could see that you were learning this wonderful language that, that um, becomes almost... <laughs> becomes almost a, uh, a religion for some people. <laughs> uh, that, that, that was certainly one, one side of Mr. Gamble's work that I really loved, although um, Mr. Gamble, it, it was curious. In, in <laughs> I used to, after, after I was with him like four or five years, I would bring in paintings and I would we talk about reproductions of paintings, like America Sada or something. And Mr. Gamble was very curious about some things. Like, uh, there was one painting by America Sada that had, when you, when you design a picture, you don't want to have any negative shape, any kind of shapes that look like something else, so that when you look at it, you might see a duck or something in there. And I was pointing out to him that there was one America Sada that looked like a duck, where the chairs on the rug it looked like a duck. And Mr. Gamble said, don't show me things like that. I love this painting. And I'll, now I'll always see that. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Don't show me things like that. <laughs> he never noticed it. No, he just happened. I mean, it was just. But, just, but he's right in terms of design. Once you see something like that in the picture, you ne every time you look at the painting, you see that first. It just takes away. <laughs> in terms of patenting in the picture. I thought it was a funny reaction to <laughs> um, Well, maybe you could talk a little bit about design and some of the um, principles that you got from Gamel and, and, and also maybe we can talk a little more about mm -hmm. uh, your work and how it's... Mr. Gamel talked about... Um, uh, well, I remember um, what became like sort of like cliches talking about design. Knock the corners out of business. You ever hear that term? And when you design a picture, you, you don't, your eye can get caught in a corner. Yeah. So you always want to have a diagonal line, something that leads you away from the corners in the pictures. Always. Always have trees or something that leads you away from the corners, something that brings you away from the corners. That the the eye almost always just, just goes to the center of the picture, just, just goes to the center of a, of a rectangle, and you want to have, it doesn't have to be the center of interest, but yet you want to have something near the center that leads the eye on to the center of interest. Because the eye just for some reason goes, you want to avoid circles that will make bullseyes, because your eye will be attracted to it, or perfect rectangles or perfect squares. You want to avoid any kind of there's nothing more boring than a bunch of squares. You know, a checkerboard is rather boring in a picture. In fact, if you look at Vermeer's work, Vermeer, who's, who used, almost all his paintings have tiled floors in them, Vermeer was so passionate about it that he had a diamond-shaped floor, so you get all this endless variety as, it, as it's going back of shapes. Because the diamond shape is constantly changing size and shape as it's going back constant variety um, about having a strong center of interest, that the center of interest should, be, should have the most contrast that your eye is attracted to it, and there should be subordinate interest in the picture and quiet areas, uh, to use warm, like, like reds near the center of interest can, can help attract attention, a warm color, red or a yellow. Do you ever talk about using balance of red, always using red, yellow, and blue in a painting? 
Yeah, in fact, he, Paxton said, there's a quote from Paxton, that when you're setting up, a, he was talking about still lifes, but it's any painting. When you're setting up a picture, if it doesn't look quite right color-wise, ask yourself what of the three primary colors is missing. You know, is there a blue missing or a yellow missing? And, and usually that will help the picture. Did he talk much about Paxton's design? Designs? No, but he did say that Paxton helped him a lot with design. That he, in fact, when Paxton died in 1941, Gamble would have been in his 50s, and uh, and he said he was. Um, he felt very concerned. He wouldn't have been able to talk about design to come in and look at his pictures and talk about design. He said Paxton was very helpful in design. Yeah. Uh, did you? Were you able to sort out what it was that Paxton emphasized? Did he talk about specifics? Well, from Paxton or was all sort of molded? Just, the, just the same. It's, it's all the same thing. It's you know, yeah. wonderful arabesques. You know, beautiful patterning. Contrast in the center of interest. They have, you have a strong center of interest and subordinates. Subordinates um, lead the eye around the picture constantly. Have it lead the eye around. Avoid having like any bright colors near the frame around the periphery. Any kind of bright, you know, any light colors because it'll, it'll lead the eye out. Yeah. So um, just the standard rules. And and like I said, you can. You go to the museum, you can see it in Jerome. Another thing about Mr. Gamble that I really liked is that I studied with Mr. Gamble. Mr. Gamble studied with Paxton. Paxton studied with Della Roach. Della Roach studied with Baron Grow. Baron Grow studied with David. You, can go, you could probably trace the heritage back to the Renaissance. And, and there were studio, studio stories that came down. Um, well, let's see. Well, there were stories that um, David, David supposedly wasn't very, didn't have much of an imagination for posing, and he would have students suggest poses for his models when he was working. Now, that's, that's one of the stories I've heard. I, I don't know if it's true or not, but, <laughs> but you know, I, I just, it's, it's not impossible. I just do, I just have funny things. And, and what makes people, you know, creative, you know, what works, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of other things about Mr. Gamble. I think, the mo I think one of the most important things is that Gamble gave you some idea about what it meant to be a professional artist and the work ethic, to constantly work at it. And uh, there was a quote he told me from Paxton that I really like, and it's that Paxton said, I'm sick of geniuses. Give me somebody that works. <laughs> and I, and I, I personally believe, because I'm slow at everything, but I personally believe that that the great shortcut, you know, working at something for 25 years, because that's the only way you're going to get there. <laughs> the great shortcut is the best way, just to keep working at it. Keep working at it. Now, look, that's the great thing about painting is that you can, you can, um, by time, most painters, a lot of painters, don't get to be really good till they get into their 50s or 60s. Yeah, yeah, it is, and it's, and if you look at, like, you go to the Garden Museum, you can see the uh, Rape of Europa, which Titian painting was like 75, and it's considered the most important painting in America, and it's really wonderfully observed. So that's encouraging that um, you can work into your 70s. So it gives you hope that you can do a few good things. <laughs> I'm I'm very conservative in terms of that I I feel that so much information has been lost and that the that I purposely wanted to feel like I was really confident in making it look like nature and making it before I started to experiment with 
with like brushwork and trying to get into tending surface and things. So I, I, I would. The truth is about painting. If you do twenty really superb paintings, you're a great artist. If you do twenty paintings, fifteen. That's all it takes. It's very hard to do, of course. <laughs> So, and I look at it as painting is a marathon. It's something that you just keep accumulating information. And uh, you know, so far I've done maybe, I don't think I've done any you know, real superb pictures, but I think I've done about 10, 10 paintings that are really interesting, you know, that personal and unusual. So, it's another wonderful thing about painting is that it's a constant learning, constant learning. And I love the fact that you can, I'm very interested in the 17th century that, that you can look at the work of 17th century artists and understand a lot of what they were doing. In fact, how I got interested in the 17th century artist is reading a quote from an 18th century artist, Sir Joshua Reynolds. Sir Joshua Reynolds in 1781 visited Holland and Flanders and he wrote back to Edmund Burke in a letter, and in it he said that, geez, you know, the Dutch pictures look like nature seen through a camera obscura. And I thought, gee, that's interesting. He's talking about, he, it, and when we know we saw at least one Vermeer. He, he talked about seeing the milkmaid. And he was a superb picture. And he was talking about 17th century Dutch paintings uh, in mostly in his, di in, this, in his diary he kept of his journey. And I was fascinated that someone who lived a hundred years after Vermeer and the, and, and the great Dutch, the, you know, they called the little Dutch masters, should look at their work and know it was done with an optical instrument. And that's the, that's the earliest quote I know of someone several generations removed, three or four generations removed from from, uh, from when the work was being executed, who could look at it and know that, a, that an optical instrument was done. And then I, further on in this little booklet I had, it said that Sir so Joshua Reynolds owned the camera obscura. And I said, oh, that means it's an acquired skill that by using his camera obscura, he would learn what the distortions are, what to look for. So the camera obscura lead, I'm contrary to what, what, what art historians tell you, art historians will tell you that the camera obscura leaves no marks on the canvas. There's no evidence of it, but that's not true. It actually does leave very definite traces of the image. The image itself is the traces of what the, what the camera obscura does. And that's why Sir Joshua Reynolds could look at the picture done 80 years earlier and say this was done with a camera obscura, because he knew what the distortions were. So I found a little sketch of what Sir Joshua Reynolds' camera obscura looked like, so I built, I built a model of it and started to, to use it. And after a couple of, after you do one painting and you, one drawing from it, and you look it up and you compare it to the nature, you can start seeing exactly the distortions right away. And soon I became, you know, I, I could tell, I could look at a picture and say that, you know, this was most, more than likely done with a camera obscura that there's very definite things to look for. And then, then I also became aware of what's called this parallax effect, where an object is viewed from two different observation points. And you see that in a lot of work with camera obscuras. Artists who use camera obscuras. You see Vermeer in his great painting, The Art of Painting, has this parallax effect. And the great candelette on the Boston Museum of, of, the, of the, the, uh, the dark area at San, Mar San Marco in Venice, that has, a, that has this parallax effect in it also. Can you explain what that is? Parallax effect is, is that in the same image, there's two horizon lines. So all the objects, some objects are going to one horizon line that will be higher or lower than the other. So that, so that there's this really odd and what's really interesting is that very few people can look at it and, and figure out what's going on. The, the picture may look a little curious in some ways, but no one picks up on it. In fact, in this Vermeer, the art of painting, there's this parallax effect. And in 1669, 
a member of the patrician class from The Hague visited Vermeer, and, and they know this from a diary he left in French, because you know, French was, was, was the dominant culture, and the educated people all spoke French. French was a dominant culture, cultural influence, the court of Louis XIV. And in this diary, for the first time, in fact, this, this uh, John Monteus, this, this Yale scholar who's worked on, who's done a great work on Vermeer and has probably doubled our knowledge on Vermeer, said that uh, in this diary, he came across what, what astonished him was this quote saying, I went to visit the famous, the celebrated Vermeer. He says, I had never heard that before, that Vermeer was famous in his lifetime. Because yeah, everybody thought Vermeer was obscure, no one knew anything about him. But as it turns out, Vermeer was famous in his lifetime, the celebrated Vermeer. And, he, and, in the, and then he went back like a month later and again looked at Vermeer's paintings and, and put in his diary. And he also talks about that he, he saw many curiosities in paintings made by Vermeer. He said the most curious, one of the most curious aspects of Vermeer's paintings is the perspective. Now, historians have been wondering, ever since they've come across this diary, what did he mean by the curious perspective? Because the perspective looks perfect in Vermeer's picture. Well, when they are the painting, which we know Vermeer owned at that time, because it was in Vermeer's household when he died. In fact, his family tried to, to keep it from being sold when, in the bankruptcy, in the bankruptcy of, uh, auction of his, of his belongings. And his wife, in, in the court documents, gives us a title so we can assume that that's Vermeer's title, The Art of Painting. That painting has this parallax effect. And this, this, this uh, Dutchman who, who left this diary was an amateur painter. And I think he probably knew enough about drawing to see this parallax effect, which is a curious perspective distortion in this painting. And that's probably what he means by the curious perspective. <laughs> Um, have you ever tried to use that in your own work? Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I do. I do more of that now. I, I use parallax effects because you can. I've learned from looking at the Dutch how much you can distort things, how much you can you can put things in different perspectives. And it still looks reasonable. Oh no, one no. If you know what you're doing, no, one no. And actually, and there's a wonderful example at the Boston Museum of Jerome, the great Jerome, in which he doesn't use a parallax effect but he does something else for a storytelling effect that's wonderful. It's a visual lie. It's what I call the gentle art of lying. These, these visual lies that become acceptable. And it, the Eminence Greece is a wonderful, wonderful, and there's also a perspective error in that picture. Yeah. And also very interesting about that picture is that his perspective was a communist and left, we had to leave France uh, just about the time Vermeer was working, I mean, excuse me, uh, Jerome was working on that painting. And that may be why there's this perspective in it. <laughs> <laughs> he ended up in Boston, by the way. The, yeah, Jerome's the, perspective, the perspective, yeah, ended up, in, ended up in Boston working for a magazine doing illustrations in Boston. Mm. <laughs> No, no. People didn't well, people probably didn't need them here, no. no. And actually, that, that's another interesting point, I think, in terms of some, some art historians don't like the ideas of the Dutch using camera obscuras to help with perspective, because what the camera obscura really is, it's just the most um, elegant of perspective machines. And, in the hand, and as you get to use it more and more, it's wonderful what you can do with it to manipulate, to manipulate it to control how, how you distort the image. And uh, any Dutch artist would have been aware of how it distorts nature and how it can actually make an image look grander than it is by the way it distorts. So how do you think Vermeer actually used the well, his two earliest pictures, Diana and uh, 
the hunt scene with Diana and Christ in the house of Martha and Mary. Both those pictures have real serious problems with proportions and also marked insensitivity to uh, the way the human anatomy is expressive. He had very coarse hands. He has Diane with these very large hands of a workman, and she's a goddess, and she has these huge hands. And Christ has no chest, no shoulders, no, not enough room in his cranium for a brain. I mean, this has to be the sorriest representation of the Messiah in all of Western art. The, the, these sort of insensitivities make it hard to believe that, you, that Vermeer would have studied for a long time with a figure painter, because figure painters would talk about making the hands elegant and expressive. Just think of like a Van Dyke, how Van Dyke's hands are so expressive and so elegant looking. You know, Van Dyke took these, this English nobility who were a bunch of brutes and turned them into these very elegant looking gentlemen. <laughs> So you can tell that there was a, ch a turning point in Vermeer's work? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In 1656, with the, um, um, the picture that's now called The Prodigal Son, that's a modern title for it, but it's really Wine, Women, and Song. I think Vermeer found the camera obscura. All of a sudden, his proportion problems are gone. That's what a camera obscura will do. It'll, you can trace the image to get perfect pers perspective or not perfect perspective, but a convincing perspective. It's not perfect in terms of the way the human eye sees perspective, but it's a convincing expressive yeah, uh, perspective. Trace it onto the he would trace it, Objective. could trace it right onto the camera, and I'm confident he did that. And but then he he wouldn't need it any longer, and then he would just work because he was a wonderful. He could observe nature and get subtle, subtle effects of of light and things. That wasn't his problem. His problem was proportions. And man's a tool-making animal, and you make tools to eliminate problems. And, and it was also very common. The camera obscure was being used by numerous artists in the 17th century, and in the 18th century. Yeah. I mean, if you compare Vermeer and Canaletto, you can see a lot of, s that the pictures are quite different in terms of subject matter. Vermeer is, uh, Vermeer is doing interiors, you know, they believe Vermeer probably only worked in five different rooms. Uh, all the work that's come down to us were probably done in five different rooms. And uh, Canaletto worked mostly in Venice, but also in England and in landscapes. But uh, there are strong similarities in their work. There are s these little circles of confusion you can see in some of Canaletto's paintings. These little perfect little round highlights. And this parallax effect and this sense of depth, this exaggerated sense of depth, which you also see in the camera obscura, and you see in Vermeer's work. In fact, in fact I think, I think it, there's, it would be interesting to compare the superb picture at the, at the Museum of Fine Arts, the, the candlelight with the Museum of Fine Arts, I'll compare it to Vermeer's the art of painting and, and point out the similarities in the two pictures. You were talking yesterday about um, how you discovered that the depth of Vermeer's studio was only a little bit different from your own studio. Yeah, it's Vermeer, primarily, they know, they're not exactly sure when, but certainly by 1660, he was married, what, 1654, 55, and he, he married into a rather wealthy Catholic family, and his, his family owned a, a tavern on, on the, the great market in Delft, Market Square in Delft, and he married this Cath into this Catholic family which lived on the other side of this market, more or less across, you know, across the square from him. And, and they know that by 1660, Vermeer was living in this house with his mother-in-law and his wife. And then he had something like 15 children, 12 survived. Hmm. Yeah. We, we both realized sooner or later. Sooner or later. Yeah. 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 earlier, too. Yeah. 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 Oh, is that what right? right? we're camera. We're just going to shut this off. And I'm going to turn mine off, too. Uh, All right, David. No. Yeah. <laughs> Great, David. <laughs> Should we roll on any of this? Yeah. Can, can I get up? Can I get up for a minute? Can we roll tape on any of this? Oh, on the 
Yeah. Jane, yeah. Would, would you mind? I okay. We're rolling? We are rolling. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to talk about design now. All right. Mr. Gamble told us to always look for diagonal lines, and you can see it in this wonderful Vermeer. The obvious big diagonal line of the drapery here. The folds in the map that Vermeer probably went to great trouble to get these folds in here because it makes a pyramid. There's a pyramid shape. You always want pyramids in your pictures because a pyramid is stable, very stable. And this line is picked up on the leg right there. No accidents. This is all very carefully done. There's folds on the map here that are picked up in this ribbon work in the back of this costume that the artist is working. All that is very carefully done, and these lines continue right down to where that chair is. Again, that's part of the reason why that chair is there. All this very careful weaving of the picture, plus the way the eye is led from light areas to dark, to light, to dark, that the eye is constantly being led around the image. Back, coming around here, back in to the, to the picture, to the center of interest. Over here, the strong line bringing you over to here. All this very carefully, very, very carefully arranged. Probably took him two months. I'm going to be all surprised if it didn't take him two months to set that picture up, just to arrange it. Not to mention the difficulties of getting the right props, which no one ever talks about. This, this map here shows the low countries as they were under the Habsburgs. A hundred years ago, this paint, a hundred years before the picture was painted, the painting was probably started in 1566, which is the hundredth anniversary of the Dutch beginning their revolution for freedom against the Spanish Empire. This is the Low Countries as it looked under the Spanish Empire. He's painting, this history painter is painting the Musa history. There's all kind of references to history. The chandelier has a double-headed eagle of the Habsburg family. The whole scene is taking place under the Habsburgs. In other words, here's the low country under the Habsburgs. Here's the, the shield under the Habsburgs. I think Vermeer is saying that artists and models, the silhouetted against this map, working in the low countries under the Habsburgs were oh, neighbors. <laughs> uh, so, the Low Countries, artists painting the and Low I, Countries. I think, I think Ramirez was saying, I mean, the trouble it would take to get this map, a very large map showing the Low Countries as they were under the Habsburg, to get the chandelier that has the double eagle of the Habsburg family symbol. I mean, it takes time to acquire all these props. This is not, you know, not by accident. He has a mask here showing, I think, represents the classical world, and also we know in the classical world that masks were worn by actors or hypocrites is what they were called. <laughs> and I think for me, I think this is Vermeer's answer to Michelangelo. Michelangelo said the history painting, is essentially what Michelangelo says, history painting is the highest form of painting and all the Dutch artists do is copy nature. In fact, there was a cliche in the 17th century that the Dutch were very clever mimickers of nature, but that's all mindless copiers of nature. And I think Vermeer is refuting that by saying, oh no, I, I am an intellectual. I see the pretense of what you history painters do. And, and as Vermeer was using scientific instruments, a camera obscura and lens system, we have circles of confusion that you see in lens systems. A lens system cannot be separated from Galileo and the new sciences. What, what are the sciences, but the, the, the modern sciences are based on the study of nature seen through instruments that enhance man's senses. And Vermeer worked by viewing nature through a lens system. I think Vermeer is making the relationship between himself and the new sciences. And also, Holland in the 1650s and 60s was the place where science, the cutting, cutting edge of science was happening. Holland and England, because of the, of the humiliation of Galileo. 
the, and the you know, really the, the destruction of science in Italy because of uh, its opposition to church doctrine. And, and don't forget that the, that the telescope was actually invented in Holland, although it took Galileo to turn it into a scientific instrument, and the microscope was invented in Holland. And also, Vermeer, a man born in the birth records of Delft, the same, in the same page as Vermeer's birth record, is Leeuwenhoek, who was the great microscope uh, discoverer of the 17th century. Leeuwenhoek came from Delft, this very small town, and here we have two men who worked with lens systems and are outstanding in their field, coming from Holland, the Low Countries. And Vermeer's answer to Michelangelo's criticism was then that his was a higher form of art? That he paints the truth. He studies nature through scientific instruments and makes observations of truth as opposed to this pretense of this man who's taken, who's taken a girl, given a very large attribute. He's got, she's got this huge book to hold, this large trombone. He gives her a bird's nest of a, of, of, of a laurel reef. He makes her look like she's out of a bird brain <laughs> to hold this. And, and what's, there's human, a lot of human Vermeer's work. He has her reading a letter. She's reading a letter. She's not musing on history. She's reading a letter, which of course is the way Vermeer would have posed her, reading a letter. <laughs> Something that she would have done. Vermeer paints the truth, and history painters, it's all pretense. Also, another bit of humor is Vermeer has this artist laying in the painting, and he's using a mall stick to lay in the painting. A mall stick is used for finish work, not for the beginning. So this man's working the wrong way around. He's working backwards, as it were. I, I think that's all very carefully calculated for storytelling effect, and, and I, I truly believe that Vermeer is, is associating himself with the new philosophy, the new science, and saying that, that these so-called history painters are actually just hypocrites, pretending, pretending to paint the muse of history. That, that girl's no more the muse of history than I am. <laughs> And in terms of design, there's big diagonal lines, the leading light and dark patterning, the way it's, your eye is led, constantly being led around. How corners, how the corners are knocked out of business so that your eye is led away from the corners, always being led away from the corners. No, no real light area n near the frame. Always like a, see how it's a middle tone? And I try to do the same thing in my picture where the corners are knocked out of business, big diagonal lines all coming down, pointing you to the center of interest, have all these lines that come down that point you to the center of interest. All, everything is moved around, trees are moved, like this tree was actually over there. Constantly rearranging nature to make, make a, a, an interesting and expressive abstraction. It's, it's, not, it's not the copy of nature, it's, it's a response to nature. That's what traditional painting is, a response. I think it's a response to nature. Did you, obviously as a student, you wouldn't have been doing that. No, no, as a student. You, you, so Gamma wouldn't have talked about this. No, no, it's, when you're a student, it's, it's, it's so hard just to try to learn how to make it look something like nature. It takes you, I think it takes years to. How long did it take? Shifting the truth slightly. Actually, studying the Dutch when I really it was about seven years ago when I started to study, really start analyzing paintings and taking them apart. What I call taking them apart, where you really try to understand how the, uh, this painting is made. In this picture here, if you if you take all these perspective lines of this table, the tile floors, they all lead up to a vanishing point right in here, right in here. But this chair, this chair in the foreground, comes up to a much higher vanishing point, way up here. And that's called a parallax effect, that there's two different horizon lines in the picture. And, and the reason, I know why Vermeer did that, is th this, this reproduction is only about half the size of the actual painting. In order for Vermeer to get these figures large enough 
to fit, to fit that canvas, he had to move his camera way up to do the tracing. Not only that, but he not only, when he moved it up, and I actually worked this out because I have the tile, the floor on, in my studio. He not only moved the camera way up, and then he had to raise it because he had the image being projected down. That's why you can see a lot of the top of the table here. Even though the horizon line is right here, and if the camera was down looking straight on, you'd see much less of this tabletop. There's actually ways of comparing this to other paintings. And then, after he put in these figures here, right this area here, up close, he brought his camera back to bring in the tapestry and this chair in the foreground. So he superimposed these two images on each other to achieve this. And this also proves he did not copy the image because this image doesn't really exist. So he didn't, he didn't do any copying. In the, and also, there's, there's, there's very strong technical reasons why he could not have copied the image. Every historian who's tried to duplicate Vermeer's work always contaminate their work with 20th century equipment. They use cameras or they use viewing screens made out of very thin plastic. Those things didn't exist in the 17th century. For Vermeer to, to work from a camera obscure and copy the image, as many his people suggest, the image would be the upside down and reversed, and he'd be working in a dark chamber, or, or more likely is that he would project it onto a piece of oiled paper and work on the back with the image coming through and it would be true. He could make it true. But if he did that, the oiled paper would have local color, so slight yellow ochre. I made, I made these screens. I have cameras that have these screens in them. And the whole image would have a yellow ochre effect. And none of this exists in Vermeer's work. And also, they're using the camera obscura. You're working in this dark room, this dark chamber. You would have, the only way you could actually do it is to, is to go inside this chamber and then to memorize the image, come outside and paint. You can't paint in the dark. You can't paint in the dark chamber. The, the demands on the visual memory would be so extraordinary. Now, one could say, well, Vermeer, Vermeer was a genius, and he had this great visual memory. But his early paintings, where all these drawing mistakes come in, these drawing mistakes are because Vermeer had a very, very average visual memory, or below average visual memory. That's what drawing errors like that are. It's, 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 it's not having the ability to hold that in, that in your mind's eye, to hold that image in your mind's eye. So would he have projected, so uh, he couldn't project it because it was upside down and backwards, so how did he actually use it to help him as a tool? No, you can project it. You, you can set it up with mirrors. You can set the camera obscure up with a mirror so that you can get a, a positive image. Mm -hmm. You can do it and get and a positive, and get, you trace it, and then you, you, you got the image on the canvas, and then you start painting like you would any picture. Just turn it to nature and start working. Just start coloring in the image. But you think that he, he wouldn't have laid it in using, you, you, what you're, I'm hearing you say is that he used it as a tool to check himself? No, he used it to draw in the image in chalk, just as this drawing here is in chalk. See how this drawing? This is the only drawing that we know from Vermeer, right here, this, on the painting. And it's in chalk. And by radio x-rays of Vermeer's work, radiographs, of Vermeer's work, there's no drawing on his canvases at all. He probably worked in chalk. And, and, and he would just would disappear when he laid in the paint. And his paintings are laid in in big masses. And that's what, what you get in the camera obscura. You, get, you would just draw in these big shapes. You draw in the big shapes and then you color it in once you get it drawn in. Just as this fella is laying in here that this drawing shows in chalk, and he lays it all in big masses, and he just starts working it up like any, like a painting. Because the camera obscura took care of his proportions problem, the problem he had with proportions. Uh, we have to stop for JJ. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's all kind of boring now.
Father. It's not, not, as, not as interesting as it used to be. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about these puppets, like the Dharma puppet? Yeah, sure. I, that's my gentle revenge on Mr. Gamble. <laughs> I think all these discussions about Mr. Gamble deserve an image here. That puppet, uh, should, we, should we do it now? Yeah. 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 I'm going to be in the way. No, you're not. It's up top. You're, right you sure? you're well out of the way. Okay. The, uh, that puppet is, I wanted to do a painting relating my experiences with Mr. Gamble. And Mr. Gamble, at times, was very cruel in his criticisms, and he was something of a tyrant. So I thought of making a puppet of him as Shakespeare's great villain and tyrant, Richard III, a sort of a humorous revenge on Mr. Gamble. It took me almost two years to carve the head to get it just right, and I went to great trouble to get a very good likeness and to get the right expression. And, and I spent a good deal of time researching the costume. That's what a conservative gentleman would have worn in 1480s, in the time of Richard III. And he's sitting on a very accurate model that I made of the coronation throne in Westminster Abbey, which Richard, the, that, that was a chair that was around in Richard III's time. So Richard III actually would have sat on that throne. If you're going to get revenge, you know, you've got to do it upright. <laughs> so I did a painting of Mr. Gamble as, as um, Richard III. And I keep the puppet up there now. Where's the painting? Oh, uh, well, I sold it. It was actually a commission. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about your interest in puppets? Yeah, well, I like them for their theatrical aspect. And I, go to, I, I do go to great trouble to make, you know, to get costumes. I do research on costumes. And... Um, Try, you know, try to do a lot, of, a lot of work on carving the faces and making them expressive and theatrical. I'm, um, I'm just working now on a puppet that's behind here on the Wizard of Oz, the Scarecrow on the Wizard of Oz. It's over here. You can only just... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, well, now, can you talk a little bit about these guys? Like, are you... Is my I'm looking at cross. I'm looking at cross. Yeah, behind the couch. Yeah. Can I move my coat? That's okay. I'm just looking at the heads above the edge. So. What, are, what are the different characters you've got there? Well, there, there's um, <laughs> one. The one in red at the, it is a comedy dell'arte character. That's the that's the puppet I copied of Mr. Gamble. So I was learning about the make puppet, make puppets. The other one is an intellectual. That's a painting I did of art historians. He's in a doctorate gown. And he's sitting on a craftsman in the painting. <laughs> the art historian sitting on a craftsman. <laughs> the artist. The other is sort of a. Uh, it's, it's, I haven't used the, the, the next puppet down in the. In the uh, what the ruffled collar is a. Uh, it's, it's a symbol of sadness, but. I, I haven't used it in the painting. The next one down is a motley fool. I love fools, motley fools. Like in Shakespeare, who, you know, always has motley fools be the wise ones in the play. <laughs> the fools are the wise ones. And there's another motley fool after him, <laughs> which I've used several times. And then the last is Don Quixote, a character that I really admire. He's He's the only person I know is more detached than I am from the real world. <laughs> Don Quixote, I've used in the painting before, man, but I've just got an idea. I'm going to make a horse for Don Quixote. I'm going to have him riding a horse. Huh. I really like the character of Don Quixote. You know that Cervantes died the same year Shakespeare did? And you know that Galileo was born within a couple of hours of Michelangelo dying? In fact, Galileo was convinced that he had inherited Michelangelo's spirit. You know who else was born that year? Christopher Marlowe and Shakespeare. That was 
Arguably, 1564 was arguably the best year for humans ever. It was a very good year. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, the Boston School's provincial. I mean, it's very provincial. It's really New England. <laughs> it's very limited in what they were doing. Yeah. You know, it's mostly sort of a genteel class. You know, the images of, of people in well-to-do interiors. And, and also strictly painting from nature and not. Yeah. Do, do, or do, or well, yeah, there wasn't much history painting or anything. Mr. Gann was about the only history painter. Um, because, you know, they reflected their time. They, they, they all were in Europe at the, when Impressionism became all the rage. It was something new and exciting, so they reflected their time. And, and it, it's amazing to me that one generation that Paxton, who was with Jerome, knew nothing about his color conventions or how he made his history paintings, apparently. And he must have been exposed to it. But he wasn't interested. He was only interested in Impressionism. You know? It was all new and exciting. In fact, Jerome supposedly said to him when Paxton was leaving, what happened to all the promise? You know? yeah. And something like that, yeah. Well, it's a lot of information has been lost about picture making, one thing. One, another thing is, sadly, we're so isolated now that it, most of us spend all our time isolated, which is sad because um, I know for myself, we're talking with Gary, that he remembers things that Mr. Gamble said that I don't, don't remember at all, you know. Uh, if, even if Mr. Gamble said them, he may not have. You know, I think he... Uh, you know, when you're teaching, you, you phrase things differently and you talk with different, you, each student's unique and you talk with each person about different things. And it's sad about, and Mr. Gamble felt that, you know, that a lot of information that he wanted was lost. It's sad that so much, I, I think, I personally think we're witnessing, you know, the, the death throbes of, of a wonderful language of painting that's slowly disappearing. It's also sad to me that, you cannot go to, as far as I know, any museum in America and see a Rembrandt. You see it in artificial light, not in daylight. And there's at least two letters surviving from Rembrandt talking about he wants his pictures to be seen in strong light. And of course he meant daylight. He meant daylight. Uh, it's sad to me that, that <coughs> if you consider like the Vermeer's Art of Painting, painted in 1666, 1667, at the very time, it's, it's entirely reasonable to assume that as the, when Vermeer was working on this picture, about a couple of hundred miles away across the English Channel, Newton was doing his experiments with the prism and, and saying that the attributes of light is that it carries all these different colors in it. And, and that light's property is, in, is color, and that all local objects just, just reflect or absorb color. So in order to see an oil painting, and this was well understood in the 17th century, you have to see it in the light in which it was painted. And we know all 17th century, 18th century, 19th century pictures were painted in daylight. There's no mystery. We know that for a fact. And the pictures should be seen in that same light. Because pigments come from numerous different sources, you know, they're minerals, they're clays, they're, they're uh, stone, they're all, they come from all different sources, chemical mixtures. Why should an orchestration of pigments react to daylight the same way as artificial light? It's a different cult spectrum, so they're going to react in different relationships and actually changes quite 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 markedly changes the value relationships when you, change, when you put paintings from daylight to artificial light. And it saddens me that I, I can't go to the museum and see 
see a Rembrandt the way he wanted it to be shown. And he went to all this trouble. I mean, who, who would ever deny that color was an essential to painting? And yet you're not permitted to see the colors. It's, it's extraordinary. And Gamble used to go into the museum. And rave. And, and go, I mean, unfortunately, Mr. Gamble, you know, who, who because of, he came from a prominent family, had social connections. And, and he actually, I, I know when I was a student of Mr. Gamble's that uh, it was arranged for him to talk to two curators there about showing the pictures in daylight. And unfortunately, Mr. Gamble got angry and insulted them. And of course, they, you know, the last thing they were going to do is do what he would have. You know, can't you see what I'm talking about? Can't, you just can't see anything, can you? Can't see anything. <laughs> Well, it's sad that he, you know, that he couldn't have been more pol you know, pol politi politic in, in, in his approach to, um, to, you know, trying to get across his views. It's, it's sad, it's, it's, it's tragic that we can't see, that, can't see these pictures. This wonderful, this wonderful cultural inheritance that we received, we're not permitted to see it. I, I think it's I think it's simply because people come into their house and they put on the lights, <laughs> you know, with with so live with technology now that even when there's daylit galleries at the museum, they still have these lights on. Why? In fact, I I'm sure that at MIT they can come up with that they probably have some instrument there that can measure the color relationships that are coming off a painting in daylight and in artificial light, and I bet you they'll show that there's a different relationship through that whole scan. I bet you they'll show that. I know it will show that. In fact, I'd like to do something like that, because people will listen to science. They won't, they won't listen to artists, right. they'll, but they'll listen to science. Well, isn't it for conservation reasons, too? They have some problem with, uh, they don't want sunlight on the painting. Yeah, but, but I mean, it's very simple to put... Put just noise light. The, well, to put a... There's these plastics with, with absorb ultraviolet light and they absorb 99 point and something I mean they can they can can get it so that the picture will be absorbed it will be exposed to very very minuscule amounts of, of they can probably even they could probably even come up with some plastic that you know takes out a hundred percent you know but I know they go over 99 yeah. percent yeah. and it's not expensive yeah. I mean that you can buy very cheap sunglasses okay. They, they cut out the UV. Yeah. So I mean, it's technically, we you know we live in this in this technically very sophisticated society. Yeah, but it's not applied. But it's not applied. It's not rational. Yeah. It's not rational. I mean, it's, to me, it's fascinating that at the same time as Vermeer was painting this, Newton was doing those experiments with the prison. At the same time, the same days, probably. And you know, and Vermeer was using a lens to study nature and and and. And Newton's using another scientific instrument, this prism, to separate light and to, you know, and to analyze. Oh, yeah. You know, something very interesting, there's a very interesting story. Because Newton discovered that light had this property of, of color in it, you know, it's different wavelengths and it breaks up and bends, that he thought that you could never make a refracting telescope that wouldn't have color distortion in it because pr lenses act as a prism, you know, they break up the color a little bit. In the 17th century, all the lenses had color distortions in them, all, all, the, all the telescopes. Yeah. And that's why, that's why Newton, uh, Newton invented the reflecting telescope that used mirrors and not lenses. Oh, so it wouldn't have that. And he said, you, you, can never, you can never have a lens that won't have that color distortion. A, a couple of years after Newton died, Newton died in 1727. In 1730s, 1732, an English lawyer named Hall was an amateur in, uh, telescope maker. And, and he was thinking, well, you know, the human eye is a lens system, and there's no color distortion in the human eye. There's got to be a way of doing it. And he's the one that discovered an achromatic lens, a color-correct lens. And he discovered it by... Just a few years after. Yeah. 
he, and he discovered it by accident. He was fooling around with two lenses, one made out of crown glass and one made out of flint glass. And he happened to put them over, you know, in front of each other. And when he did, he, that, that they, they offset, it each, offset each other the way they distort color, and there was no color distortion. So he was a lawyer and he was a clever man, and he realized that this was a big discovery he made. So he wanted to keep it hid. He, he went to a lens maker in one part of London and had them, he drew up a diagram and had them made a positive lens out of crown glass. He went across London to another lens maker and had them make a negative lens that would fit right in, a couplet they call it, that would fit right on this other lens and make a color correct lens out of flint glass. Wouldn't you know it, one of the ironies of history, both lens shops subcontracted the job to the same lens grinder. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> the lens grinder was, you know, making these lenses, and he noted that they were both going to this Dr. Hall. Oh. So he thought, geez, that's curious, you know. That's yeah, and they're coming from two different shops, you know, so the, and he was, and he knows that they fit together, and he put <laughs> no, no distortion, and so that was it. Paul didn't, didn't make a dime. Isn't that an amazing That's story? An unfair story, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing story. Yeah, it is. It's I love history for yeah, that. You know, know. You know these person, personal. personal things, things yeah. that you know, no matter you know, what chances there are something like that right, happening. I know. <laughs> it's a great story. I was thinking, so are we keeping you from anything? Are you? Okay, so you're so we're shooting. You're shooting around. Okay, um, just Alan don't has shoot a great him. Great story because he's writing a book of um, landmark discoveries in science of the 20th century. Oh, the 20th century. Yeah, yeah. and the greatest discoveries in chemistry, physics, biology, and um, let's see, chemistry, physics, biology, and astronomy. Three. Astronomy. I guess maybe it is astronomy. Yeah, I mean, cause, cause, be yeah, because yeah, because I mean, ninety percent yeah. of what they know about is now in the last yeah. twenty years. Yeah. <laughs> so, but there's this great story. And I'm trying to remember. I'm not going to um, see if I can remember it correctly. I mean, there are all these. A lot of these were Nobel Prize winning papers. And um, I'm trying to remember. There was a biology discovery that was made by accident. Yeah, a lot of them were by accident, and you know, the Nobel Prize went to somebody later on. It was, but yeah. I, I'm trying to remember the particular one that he, that well, he told me that was just so mind-boggling. Well, it's, it, it's like the double helix there. That woman well, took yeah, a photograph right. and she didn't know what she was looking at. Yeah. And, and Wilson or Hicks, or one of them, looked at it and realized what it was. Uh, yeah. You have to see, you see the color that they're getting. Can I stand up? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah actually, you want to, we can I'll just. We can take the mic off now. Okay. Oh. oh, wow. Isn't that great? Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've just been going across and catching little pieces. Gee, little it's amazing pieces. how yeah. your cameras make it lighter than, than it is in nature. Yeah. You ca and, you the, and the it same gathers, color, I mean, great color. You know, it it gathers in more light than the human eye can see. Huh? Yeah, yeah, these are very, you know, the, the camera technology has just improved so you, the you mean it's better than the camera obscura? <laughs> <laughs> you wait, don't use this. If they, had, yeah. if they had these back then. <laughs> you know, get yourself a little LCD projector. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and then you can distort it any which way you want. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, you better take take. I don't wanna. I don't wanna do something dumb.